And I'm going to just share our screen here. And then as you come in, you will be muted and that's just to help us with any um, background noise. All right, so <clears throat> we'll start in just a minute more. And don't forget if you haven't, if I, I noticed that it's sometimes muting folks, but not, so just make sure you're muted. If you wanna share your cameras, that's perfectly fine. We love to see um, your beautiful faces. We like to see who's here. I see there's another Lydia here. Hello. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome. Thank you for spending your morning with us. Okay, well, we're at 10 o'clock, so we want to make the most of our time today. Um, we have a very, um, I think, interesting and engaging webinar today, again, engaging with Native American families and communities with Jacqueline Gray and Marcelina Shackelford. Um, they are joining us today to really sort of help us learn more about how to engage with Native American families, as well as talk about the history of Native, Native American families within the child welfare system, which I think is very um, interesting and also not very well known information. So let me just advance this. Before we start, I wanted just to bring your attention to a few technical things. As some of you may or might, may not know who are familiar with Zoom, there is a little microphone on the bottom left-hand side of your toolbar, your control panel. And this is used to click or unmute, uh, or sorry, mute or unmute yourself. We ask that during the presentation, you unmute yourself, but we do welcome you um, to unmute yourself when we are having um, conversations. So we encourage that, in fact. Also, you can click your video on and off. So if you don't feel like your camera ready, please feel free to do that. If you wanted to, um, you know, share your face with us and your, um, you can do that as well. 
the chat function is also sort of like in the middle here. The chat function, you can communicate directly with myself. Um, Anvi Din is another one of our team members who can help if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, we have a couple of other strategies folks online that can help. Um, we all have strategies backgrounds. So that's how you know who we are. So if you have any questions during the presentation, I um, may if I'm engaged in presentation or and I'm not available, any one of the folks with a strategies background can help. Also, we are providing closed caption. Um, you can see uh, down below that you are able to do that. If you click on where there's three dots, it says more, you're able to, to do that. There's also this icon that has CC. So if you need closed captioning, if you're, you know, you wanna just be able to see that because um, that's easier for you to follow along, then you, you're able to do that, click that as well. Also, we have reactions. I always like these because they've added some new ones, so it's kind of fun. So you're able to do that as well. So if there's something that resonates with you that you're like, oh, wow, that's really, that's that's great, or that's exciting, or whatever your re reaction is, you can always use those. We like those as well. I'm Lydia Marquez. I'm a Senior Technical Assistant Specialist at Strategies TA, and I will be your facilitator today. Um, Lola Cornish is also a Senior Technical Assistant Specialist. She'll be joining us later on today and um, to kind of just help facilitate the conversation. Anvi Din is our events coordinator. She can also help if you have any technical um, questions. And again, we have some other folks from Strategies I see on today. Um, we have our co-directors, our co Sarah Lacqua and Michael Williams is here. And also my um, colleague, Rosalind Dong, who is also a senior, senior technical assistant specialist is here today supporting us. So I thank them all for joining us today. This webinar is brought to you by the generosity of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Strategies TA is a collaboration between the Child Abuse Prevention Center and the Children's Bureau of Southern California. So we work together to provide technical assistance support to child abuse prevention planning teams throughout the state of California. Strategies TA, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, our work is really grounded in these core values, collaboration. So we just want to promote collaborating um, between systems. Equity is a big one for us. You know, we want to make sure that our work is rooted in equitable systems accountability that we're making sure that we are accountable to to the teams that we're supporting and also that um, we're holding other folks accountable for the work that they're doing in the community community voice that we're constantly thinking about how we can bring different voices from the community forward and also strength based so this value is important for us to really make sure that we're looking at this work from a strength-based perspective. So today's um, webinar will be um, presented by Jacqueline Gray and Marcelina Shackelford, and I wanted to introduce them. So for Jacqueline, Jacqueline Gray is an enrolled member, Little Shell Chippewa Tribe of Montana, she has a master's degree in organizational leadership and a bachelor of social and behavioral sciences, minoring in healthcare administration. Since 2014, Jacqueline has been working in native communities under the tribal MIECHV grant in Southern California. She's been a home visitor project coordinator and is now the role, in the role of program director the program Tribal Family Partners is a team of 10 with the capacity to serve 125 families with native children under five. 
TFP operates out of Riverside, San Bernardino County, Indian Health, and has been involved in navigating the challenges and the successes of early interventions with parents and caregivers of Native children under five years old. And then we are also joined by Marcelina Shackelford. Marcelina Shackelford is Luceno and Cupeno from the Pechanga and Pala Indian Reservations. Marcelina is a community outreach and prevention educator for Riverside, San Bernardino County, Indian Health Native American Resource Center. Marcelina received her BA in liberal studies with a minor in sociology from Cal State San Bernardino in 2002. She began working at RSBCIHI in 2013 as a social worker, overseeing the general assistance program and transitioned into the Native American Resource Center. Marcelina has authored, co-authored five grants at both the county and federal level since working with RSBCIHI. She's currently the chair for San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health's Native American Awareness Subcommittee. Marcelina also provides cultural competency trainings in various agencies within San Bernardino and Riverside counties. She is certified in Safe Talk, Assist, QPR, and is a certified facilitator in the NCTI Crossroads, Real Colors, and Generation Red Road curriculum. So I'd like to welcome both folks to our um, webinar and I will hand it over to them. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I just say a little bit more about the program that I'm working with. I wanted, so the RSBC IHI, if we abbreviate that, that's the Riverside San Bernardino County of Indian Health. Um, I've been working with home visiting, so that means we go inside the homes of the families um, and work with them on utilizing a curriculum called Parents as Teachers. So we're teaching them about child development. Uh, we're doing an activity with them based on their development. And then we also try to give them resources for family wellness. So connecting the parents with any needs. Uh, we've been recognized in the tribal community as being one of the parenting options uh, within our local community. So when, <clears throat> when families, excuse me, when families are asked to take parenting courses, often this is a culturally appropriate program for them to do um, as long as the courts are, will allow that. Um, and I'll let Marcy tell a little bit more about her program. Um, thank you, everyone. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation with you regarding um, I'm honored to be able to represent my community. Um, so uh, like Lydia had mentioned, I work with Riverside San Bernardino County Indian Health at the Native American Resource Center. Um, at the Resource Center, we're funded through um, the Mental Health Service Act. And so we are our primary uh, target population or the Native American is the Native American population. Um, and we're out to reduce the stigma and discrimination regarding mental health and accessing services. And, and part of that um, is having conversations with agencies that work with the Native community um, and how our history affects our ability to navigate through systems of care, um, as well as our population. Unfortunately, we, we know that we don't know or we haven't learned our history, our accurate history. So just being able to engage with with um, you all, uh, as well as our community. Um, we uh, have several programs that are funded through the Mental Health Service Act. We have a family resource center that's located in Barstow um, and they service all populations. Um, we also have a community health worker program that target um, the Native American population, African American population and LGBTQ population. Uh, we recently just received our um, Riverside uh, Mental Health Service Act through the Community Mental Health Promoters. And in August, we'll be starting a strengthening, well, it's celebrating families. And so that's a Native specific um, family program. So thank you so much for having us. So we wanted to start off this, this time in, in a good way. And um, I wanted to acknowledge um, the ancestors, ancestors of the land, 
Um, so I'm just going to take that time to, to read a little bit of a, well, I'll just go over the objectives really quick too. I want to talk about historical trauma. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, the impact of how our history um, and our culture affect how we access services, as well as improving those connections within our native uh, families. So if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. So uh, the land acknowledgement, we would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our, responsibil to, our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land water and air, the Kuya, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and to work on these homelands. So thank you for allowing me to acknowledge my ancestors, as well as I'm sure so many of yours and, and those original caretakers of, of our land. So thank you. Go to the next. So we have an icebreaker for you guys, and I'm not sure how this is going to work. Lydia, are you going to um, bring that in? Okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> on your phones, you can go to menti.com and then use the code five. Sorry, I'm just um, trying to get this. <laughs> 5996 9726. And um, one of the things Marceline and Jacqueline wanted everyone to do was to think of one word that comes to mind when you think about Native Americans. And then we'll be able to see the words come up here. So we're already seeing some of our words coming up. It looks really nice. Um, folks are also asking if they can put it in the chat, Lydia. Yes, you can put it in the chat. Um, that's fine as well. And I can, we can, oh, the code. Oh, the code, yeah. Oh, okay. I like that. And I see how you, the words that are larger are the ones that are popping up more of the common theme. So that culture, strong, resilient. Yes, so some of our, um, I think, more prevalent that people are, are using are also coming up um, as larger, more bold. I see a lot of a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of words here, and I know someone put something in the chat here: spiritual and proud. I love that it's resilient. You know, I think uh, as Native people, um, there's this picture that Julie always, my coworker, always puts in, in our, a lot of our. Uh, PowerPoints and it's we the resilient and so reckon recognizing you know that we are resilient despite of our history. So thank I, you think, for that. I think the resilient and strong and the proud right now represents a little bit of a movement of where we're at right now. I mean this being able to do a webinar like this represents that in this time, you know, that. People are, how do we engage with Native communities now? Um, because they're being heard and they're looking forward to interacting with them. So thank you guys for sharing. Yes, and I love that misunderstood. I think that's so, that's why we have those com these conversations is because oftentimes we are misunderstood. So thank you for, for sharing. I really, I really like that. I've never utilized that pot, uh, that kind of game, so I'll definitely have to look into that. So it's thank really you guys cool. for all, all of you for um, all of those beautiful words, you know, and um, yes, I'm proud to say that I think those represent all of us as Native people, as Indigenous people. And so I just want to thank you guys for acknowledging those attributes of, of our peoples. 
So I'm just going to, um, you know, get us started with, you know, why we're here. You know, we, we want to say that, you know, as California, as a California native, we are still here. There is that misperception uh, that um, all natives are extinct. <laughs> you know, we've unfortunately had, um, I had a coworker whose daughter uh, was in kindergarten and uh, another student asked, well, you know, what are you? And she said, I'm Indian. And she said, no, you're not. All the Indians are dead. So, you know, just that, you know, we're still here. And, and the reality is, is um, you're, you're probably servicing natives. And, and we recognize that, especially here in California, because of the Spanish influence and the mission system, a lot of the natives here have Spanish surnames. So like my last name prior to being married was Herrera. So you rec we recognize that, you know, we, we initially think that, you know, they, they'll have certain kind of name if they're Indian. But um, here um, in California, because of the mission system and because of the Spanish influence, a lot of our, our natives speak Spanish as well. Um, so we recognize that California has the largest American Indian um, and Alaska native population. Um, at, followed by um, Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, and so this map right here on the right is California pre-contact. And when we say pre-contact, it's um, before colonization. So this was all native lands here in California. Um, so um, we have this conversation with you, just wanting to let you know, we, we oftentimes hear, well, we don't serve any Native Americans, you know, and, um, the likelihood of you serving someone who's indigenous is pretty, you know, is pretty high, um, you know, especially with the enrollment process being a little bit, um, it's a little bit tricky here in California. We're the only race that actually requires enrollment. So, you know, that's kind of different too. So there's uh, 574 rec federally recognized tribes. And there's a lot of um, tri tribes that are just seeking state recognition as well. So. Um, yeah, we can go ahead and go to the next one. So uh, Lydia had mentioned that we're going to be talking about the history. And so for the Native American population, it's it's historical trauma. Um, so in regards to our history, uh, um, it meets the criteria for the United Nations uh, word for genocide. So uh, we have 500 years of systematic extermination. Um, and when that wasn't able to be completed, we see also the phase of assimilation. And so um, we see the forced relocation. So oftentimes with the reservation systems, as well as the Relocation Act here in California, um, as well as the preventing of reproduction, the sterilization, oftentimes our peoples would go in, our women would go in to get um, their tonsils removed and come out sterilized and not even know that they were sterilized without their permission. Um, and we see the forced removal of children in the boarding schools as well as uh, residential schools and um, the mission schools. Um, so we see just this massive group trauma, right, that still continues today for our population. Um, on the top, this picture is a picture of Wounded Knee. Um, and so you see in that, that ditch, I'm not even gonna say it's a grave, um, especially for our natives, peoples, you know, we have their specific ceremonies that a lot of our tribes do when they bury their loved ones. And this is just bodies dumped into a ditch. And the picture below is actually from um, Standing Rock. And so this is a peaceful protest where we have a lot of our elders that are, are were out there uh, protesting um, safe and clean water and um, just the pipeline itself. And so they put water cannons which for me, I look back and that's very reminiscent of the civil rights, you know, movement when that was happening. And this was just recent, you know, I think it was what in 2015, I, 2015 or 2016, I can't remember exactly that that happened. So, and there was no weapons, you know, our, the native people didn't have any weapons. It was just a peaceful protest. So and we recognize when we say that it still continues today, we're still seeing the challenges of our land you know, with this pipeline, you know, the people in the town, they said, we don't want this, you know, this pipeline to come through the town, so send it to the reservation. Um, as well as here, you know, locally, you know, in LA, there was the water rights uh, that needed, in, they needed to have it fixed in LA, um, the LA Water District, 
said, yeah, we'll fix it if you sign over your water rights. And then we also still see those challenges to ICWA. In 2018, there was a challenge. So the, there's this constant battle that we're still continuing. So our history, it, it's not just history, it continues. So if you can go ahead. And so um, when we talk about historical trauma, you know, we talk about um, those effects, those historical trauma responses that are still present in our communities today. And unfortunately, even within our population, even within my own community, we don't know this. We don't make that connection between historical trauma and intergenerational trauma and how that, how that has changed you know, us as a people. Um, we see a constellation of features and, and reaction to the historical. So the massive group traumas that, that our population experienced um, because of these traumas, we have lack of trust in government, governmental agencies. You know, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, even with Indian Health Services, where our, our women access service, you know, there were things that were taken from them. They were, you know, not asked if they want to be sterilized. Um, so because of that trauma, we... The, the trauma has been passed down, those responses and how we react to government agencies still affect our families today, still affect that myth. There, there's a huge mistrust in um, outside agencies. Um, you know, we, we don't feel like the governmental policy or governmental agencies have our best interests at heart. So there is that. So that, that makes it difficult for us to access service or even for us to engage. Um, and this also affects our ability to attach our children with our children. Um, you know, I'm speaking personally, my great grandma um, is from Paula. And so she was taken from her tribe at a very young age at five years old and she was sent to a boarding school originally in Paris. And then she went to Sherman Indian High School. And so at five years old, you know, she, you know, she felt abandoned by her tribe as well as her mom and her, her dad, you know, she didn't, you know, where do you learn how to become a relative? Where do you learn how to become um, a mother, but other than, you know, from, from your mother or those individuals that are being, um, that are around you. And so that ability to, you know, you learn, you don't learn how to attach with your, your children. We see a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder because of the complex trauma within our communities, as well as those unresolved grief, which we see happened historically and just compounded and have been, has been transferred from generation to generation. And as a result of, of those griefs, we see mood disorders such as anxiety that's present within our communities. Um, and that is passed down from generation to generation. You know, we have, um, we know that our children are affected with, you know, even within the womb. So if you're at a heightened state the entire time, you know, because of the complex traumas that you've been exposed to, you know, you're gonna come out feeling like that anxious and not even knowing what that is. Um, and we know that as a, as a result of, you know, the unresolved grief, the mood disorders that are with, you know, present in the communities, we have those maladaptive coping mechanisms such as alcoholism, substance use, community violence, domestic violence, um, you know, and we have high rates of, of fetal alcohol syndrome within our communities as well because of, of, of those unresolved griefs. But oftentimes, so for me, I know, that we're labeled as native people by these responses. And there is not that connection between the historical, where they come from, not even within our own population, we don't recognize why we function in the way that we function. So that. If you wanna to move, to, thank you so much. So we know that, um, that we're overrepresented in the foster care system. So this map is kind of, it just shows a little bit across the United States that American Indian and Alaska Native children are overrepresented over represent in the foster care system at a rate of 2.6 times higher than any, than, um, any other in the general po child population. Um, and Minnesota, Minnesota is at 13.9 and Nebraska is 7.7. And so, um, as a result, within Riverside, San Bernardino counties, Riverside is overrepresented as well. And so as a result of that, the, the Riverside Tribal Alliance was formed so that we could try to address that, to see why our children are being 
taken. And, and so um, we want to also recognize that, you know, the trauma that comes from our children being taken away. There's the, the trauma, the removal that, that is attached to that for the child, for the, for the parent as well. And so um, we know that there are maladaptive behaviors within our, our communities, but we also want to recognize those cultural values and this culture as a protective factor as well. And so the importance for us to maintain those, those uh, connections within our culture. So, and we know historically that wasn't the case. You know, uh, ICL was formed in 1978 as a result of those violations. You know, um, and if you are interested, we have a, a film called Dawnland, and it's a truth and reconciliation um, film in the state of Maine where it, it addresses those violations. And you hear from social workers themselves where they're saying, you know, uh, children were taken from their families simply because they were Indian. Their parents were Indian, and they were taken. They were better off, they're be thought to be better raised by white families than to, by their own family. And we see that, you know, as part of those governmental policies, when extermination wasn't, poli wasn't you know, established or wasn't able to be completed, assimilation. So the whole uh, idea behind uh, killing the Indian and saving the man, um, that's, you know, that's this whole, um, idea of we're just going to, you know, we're going to make them, we're going to assimilate them to be the best American citizen, right? And so that's when the forced removal of children started with ICWA, with taking, you know, the kids from their families and the boarding schools as well. So we want to skip to the next one. So um, why we have this conversation with you guys and, and um, with other agencies and, and our own population is how to engage our communities. Um, so we're asking you to recognize the trauma that, that these families, that our families have experienced and that historically the traumas that have been passed down. So those historical trauma responses with we refer to that as intergenerational trauma. So we see that within our communities that uh, it is at a, it's even changed us at an at a cellular level. You know that that um, that trauma being passed down from generation to generation. Those ways of being, those worldviews have been passed down, and so we want you to be able to look at them through that uh, that historical trauma lens and recognize that that. It, that dictates how we, we navigate within our systems, how we parent um, and, and have a little bit of an understanding of, of that. Um, we have this conversation with you uh, because we don't know, you know, we're not given accurate history, right? And, and we, even within our population, you know, a lot of our communities members, I didn't know about historical trauma and started, until I started working in, in the native agencies. You know, I am embarrassed to say that my children made missions you know, not recognizing that the mission system was for us as native people, slavery. That was our first form of slavery. And so, you know, um, we're taught Thanksgiving, we're taught the pilgrims and the Indians, that's what we're taught in schools. And so that's why we wanna have these conversations so that you understand our true and accurate history and how that affects our abilities to, uh, to parent, to navigate within systems of care, like I had mentioned before, as well as accessing service and our viewpoint on mental health, on, on, on health in general. Um, so we, um, we want to also recognize that implicit bias, right? Our, be aware of our own implicit bias and what our perspective is regarding the populations that we serve. Um, you know, communities of color oftentimes, you know, were labeled by, you know, or, you know, by the fact, you know, I know when work within working the native uh, population, we, I recognize that we have high rates of alcoholism, but not every Native American is an alcoholic. <laughs> and, and there's that assumption of that, you know, not, uh, or, or we, we're looked at as non-compliant, not, not understanding our relationship, the relationship that that those individuals have within, you know, agencies other than IHS, you know, or of that, that level of mistrust that exists. 
So recognizing what, what you come in, you know, what, what your understanding is when it comes to the population that you're serving. Um, and so, and then understand how the trauma can affect the parenting. So, um, and, the, and the quality of attachment between the parent and child. So oftentimes, you know, um, our parents, you know, don't have those necessary coping skills to deal with our children that, you know, so they may be triggered, you know, they may be hearing these kids crying and then they're feeling a little overwhelmed by the crying, it's triggering something within them and they don't even recognize that it's something that's passed passed down. So that lack of parenting skills, they didn't have that, that the parent model passed down to them, how we sue the child that wasn't given to them. Unfortunately, we have a lot of our children that aren't being raised by their mother or their fathers. Oftentimes it's their aunties, their grandmas, you know, it's that community that that's raising the, the children. And that is a direct result of, of historical trauma. You know, we, those kids were taken from their, their families and, um, you know, then sent back into the community, not knowing how to be a good relative, not knowing how to be a mom or, or a sister or a brother. Um, and so we also, uh, we remember that poverty is associated with multiple environmental stressors. The absence of resource for adults is inevitably translated in the lack of access to uh, basic parenting resources. Um, in the beginning, um, Lydia had mentioned that I handled general assistance. And so, um, it, for, I don't know if anyone is familiar with general assistance. It's just that it, it provides uh, just for the basic needs of individuals. It's not for families. It's so, um, we have, we think, I know oftentimes when we think of, especially here in California, you know, most individuals think, oh, all California natives are gaming. You know, we all receive per cap and they all get free education and free free health care. We have, there's a huge uh, population, there's a, tr a lot of poverty, and I didn't recognize that. You know, I uh, was able to travel to, uh, out in Thermal to Torres Martinez and up in the mountain to Anza, and being able to see just the poverty that exists even here in California, where we're perceived as gaming tribes, right? Um, and so, you know, we recognize that the fact that, you know, there, you know, we take it, I know I take it for granted, the fact that I have a driver's license, I have a car, you know, so when I was setting up these plans, these case plans for my clients, you know, it was overwhelming, you know, they don't even, most of them don't, don't even have IDs. So when, when parents lose their children, and they're given a year to you need to be taking domestic violence classes, which there's a cost associated with that. And there's, you know, and, and they're making the assumption that everybody has a car and that everybody has um, the means to be able to navigate. It's overwhelming for our families because those basic things that we take for granted, like a driver's license, a vehicle, money to be able to pay for those classes, we may have, these, these individuals don't have. You know, so when, when we have, all, there's a list of things and oftentimes our families will just be like, it's too much, it's, it's too overwhelming. And so we just don't wanna deal with it. And, you know, in addition to the fact that we just don't know how to navigate within those systems, it's very difficult for us to navigate within those systems of care because we don't have that liaison or we don't know that paperwork. I, I consider myself to be kind of functional. <laughs> And so even for me to fill out the paperwork is overwhelming. When you start to fill out things, it's overwhelming. And I feel like, I, you know, I've had a college education. And so for a lot of our families, they don't have that. And so uh, they have those, those obstacles to, to get over. And so and in addition to all of, you know, those is understanding is, um, you know, recognizing that, you um, that not all natives are the same, that we do have cultural differences. Um, I've had several, we've had several people call in, I just wanna learn how to speak Indian. How do you speak Indian? And I'm like, well, we're, we all have a different language, even different dialects. You know, we have, you know, when I was uh, talking about Anza and Torres Martinez. So Torres Martinez is actually desert Kuya and up in Anza where is, is mountain Kuya. 
So they're Kuiya, but they're from different areas and their words are different. So we all practice differently. You know, Jacqueline, I'm California native. She's from Montana. So we have different, our creation stories, all of that is different. And so um, when we all make that assumption that, oh, all, all Indians do the same thing, you know, that we all practice in the same way. So just acknowledging that, um, that um, I see there's a question in the chat. So I don't, do you want me to wait to answer that? Or I don't know how. Um. I think <clears throat> we'll have some time at the end. So I wanna just, um, we'll, we'll hold it, but okay. I will make sure that we get to this one. I just wanted to acknowledge that I don't, I'm not ignoring you. So um, yeah, and so, um, and then, like I said, you know, before is recognize um, how historical trauma affects the population you're serving. And I'm asking not only just for the Native population, just for those underserved populations, those communities of color, how their history affects how they access or how they interact with you. You know, um, and for, we don't learn about that when we go to school, right? We learn about it from dominant culture, from Western medical model, right? We learn one way of, of how we're gonna interact and that might not work for those communities. I'm gonna venture to say for most communities of color, it's not gonna the work. And so we're asking for you to take those cultural considerations, to, to put on a cultural, your cultural lens when you're viewing those patients. Um, and so when we're talking about seeking, understanding, and accepting those holistic views, so recognize as Native people, we recognize that there is our mental self, our physical self, our spiritual and our emotional self, and the interconnectedness of all of that. So um, when you treat one, you can't treat one without the other. And so just recognize that, that importance of that. Um, that you know we are spiritual beings a lot of you know when we talk about being in relationship we believe that we're in relationship you know you are my relatives i'm in relationship with her I'm, I'm i'm in relationship with all of that and so just that perspective understanding that which is contrary to to dominant culture um and we're community-based program you know so you know and i and i'm not trying to offend anybody but um you know, the American way is very individualistic. You know, it's, it's where, you know, for us to succeed individually. And so from a native perspective, you know, we're a tribe, we're a community. And so oftentimes when we raise our children, it's within the community, that support system is within our community. And so it's not just that one individual that you're dealing with. Um, and so just seeking uh, culturally uh, relevant wisdom and education. So we ask that you just look at, you know, those cultural programs like the tribal family partners, you know, um, like we, you know, I, I teach a daughters of tradition. There's uh, families of tradition. Um, we're going to be starting in August, the, the celebrating families, the strengthening of the circle, you know, and so recognizing that value. Um, that may not be considered evidence-based and still consider promising practices, but it's culturally relevant for the people that it's serving. So, um, and so even how, you know, understanding the, how the, an individual belief system and how we access services, you know, oftentimes within and, and within communities of color, uh, we don't recognize mental health. There's a huge stigma that's attached to that. And so, you know, or we're not going to take medicines because grandma said, you don't take medicines from, from um, doctors, you know, that, that historically don't have your best interest at heart. So, you know, it, it may look like they're being non-compliant and they're not, you know, willing to, but recognize that there's probably something underneath that's telling them, no, you know, don't take that or, or um, and, and how their culture affects how they're gonna access those services. Um, and so just to, we, we want you to, to recognize, to value those cultural, just to be culturally aware, uh, and how that impacts everything, how we, how we access service, how we function in the world, um, those historical resp trauma responses that are present within our communities. Um, I just ask that you would look at our population through that historical trauma lens to understand our population because that's not, our history isn't separate from us, it's still part of, of who we are. But I also wanna say that, um, we also believe that we're in that time of healing too, that seventh generation. So for me as recognizing the dysfunction within my family, but also that ability that I have 
to affect change in my life, to affect that, um, even, even heal for, for those behind me as well as those in front of me. So the seventh generation, I have that ability to heal for my ancestors and for my children and my grandchildren one day to come. So it's my responsibility as a Native person to have these conversations so that I don't continue in the, in the way of dysfunction. I think, yeah, so we have a breakout activity. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Marcelina, for that really extensive um, background, historical background. I know that that information, um, some, a lot of it was new, so I really appreciate that. Um, so now that we've had this, it, I think, really um, important historic, historical background and also cultural consideration information shared, we want you to, um, we'll break you out into groups, but we want you to um, talk about what are some ways that you'll engage Native American families now that you have heard this historical perspective, um, you've heard what the experience is like for Native American families, and also <clears throat> how might you change and shift your practice as an individual, or even what sort of things can you encourage your organization to start considering um, now that you know this information. So we're gonna have um, you know, about 15 minutes to do this, and we're, we'll have you go into breakout. Before we do that, we are gonna use Jamboard. So if you're not familiar with Jamboard, I just wanna go over some of our features. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Um, if you could just pay attention to what number room you're going into, there are six pages. So if you're in room one, you go, you do your work on page one. Um, the, the top here, hopefully you can see the cursor, you can actually um, advance to different pages. So if you're in group two, you'll advance to page two and work on that page. The question will be in the top left corner. You can use, um, there's a pen, you can write down your answers there. Um, you can use sticky notes. There's a sticky note function here. You can actually use pictures. If a picture kind of comes up in your head, you can use um, a text box. You could just click on the T with a little box around it, click it where you want it, your text to go and type in. So those are all the features that you can use. If you are not in a space to be in a group, please decline or exit yourself out um, because we wanna make sure that the people that are in there will engage. We do highly encourage you to engage. I think this is such a great way for you to share with other people and hear from other people. Um, so we'll go ahead and have um, Anvi go ahead and um, have, get people in the rooms, and we'll give you a two minute warning. So we will be sure to um, get folks. Hello, Lydia. Hi. Hi. We're in room four, but it doesn't appear that the client is in room four. Who, who was, so I don't even see the person that asked for ASL here on here. Okay. Or is there someone that? that oh, we don't asked. know who it was. <laughs> we don't yeah, know who it was. They, they're not on. Um, okay. So if. We'll just have. Yeah, if somebody happens to um, to let us know, like message us, and, uh, we'll have everybody 
join us back again. So let me get us back with our PowerPoint. And we could not get the link to the Jamboard in room three, so I'm ready to share if you guys want to put that on there. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We had, so um, I think that Google it has a personal vendetta against me sometimes <laughs> because we've used uh, several of there are different things and for some reason they tend to go wonky on me during our live events so hopefully one day it will work perfectly for me. So welcome back everyone, thank you so much for engaging in conversation with each other I popped in on a few rooms and. Um, I really just appreciated the different um, conversations that were being had. So thank you so much. I know, you know, you're working all day. Sometimes we don't have the capacity for um, conversations, deep conversations. So I do appreciate you. So um, just if we want to just put in the chat, what are some things that you're going to do to change your practice or even things you heard from your fellow participants? What are some, you know, things that that you noticed or that you heard that you're like, wow, you know, next time I engage with the family, I'm going to really consider this. I mean, I think even I don't work um, with families directly anymore, but I think even just, you know, using my um, ability to, you know, um, speak for marginalized communities and, you know, reminding folks who are doing prevention planning to really engage Native American communities, I think that's something that I will do in my practice is just reminding that these families need to be represented in child abuse prevention planning. Um, these communities need to be engaged. So Tracy says, for me, it's being aware as I work in the community to be open and willing to have these discussions. Yes. And Kim shares, honor the fact that historical trauma continues to be impactful. Yes. And I think on top of that also, that there's historical trauma, but there's still trauma happening. So I love that. Do some more research on Native American culture and continue to be culturally competent. Yeah. And I love also, um, there's a new term that folks are using called cultural humility, because I think you have to really have humility to learn about other cultures and that, um, you know, culturally humble. Yes, yes, Yvette, exactly. Um, so I love that. All right. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we participate in local cultural information and collaborative events. Yes, I think it's really important to to really seek out what you need to know and also to really engage, make those efforts. So I love that. Great group they learned about tribal TANF programs in California and that is that is great so I'm going to move us along but feel free to keep putting stuff in the chat because we are looking at that um, we are we are so excited to hear about what you're learning um, our next presenter is Jacqueline and she's going to share with us some ways to improve connections with Native American families and communities. So we'll hand this over to Jacqueline. Thank you. So like I had mentioned, I've been working in a home visiting program uh, in Native communities. And these are some of the lessons learned. Again, I was just want to reiterate, I'm not an expert, but these are some things that we've learned that have been common themes, uh, not just within our organization, but working with other tribal home visiting programs across the nation. Um, so it's, we've kind of learned as we went along and like Marcy had mentioned, you know, I come into this setting from outside. And so I walk into a family's home and first question they might be, are you native? And they say, yeah, oh, well, where are you from? And when I say I'm from Montana, they're like, oh, you're not from here <laughs> or I, go on to the reservation to serve a family and they say, 
you know, where are you from? Where did you grow up? And if I say I grew up in the city, oh, you're a city Indian. So you see that we've taken on all those little layers. And so even for myself coming into working with the native community, I've had to learn and I've had to become humble uh, just right alongside with my coworkers and the rest of uh, the people in our organization. So I just wanna share a few of our tips that we have learned. Uh, the first thing I put on here, I just wanted to emphasize, like Marcia talked about that, you know, we're looking to heal. So our children, we really see them, they're gonna be our future leaders. They're the ones, you know, they're gonna continue the healing for us. So we value those children. You know, we have these stigmas on us that they're not, don't know how to parent and things, but I always say, I don't think that anybody never truly loves their child. You know, it's just that they aren't, they don't have the same parenting styles. So the next slide, uh, this was just kind of giving you some context of the families that we've been serving in our program. Riverside and San Bernardino is the, some of the largest counties here in California. And we serve all layers, we serve self-identified native because we've acknowledged that uh, fortunately they've acknowledged that that all this stigma of the reservations are being federally recognized or state recognized that some of them you know have been shortchanged in that so we serve families that have children that are self-identified native uh, that there's a, an overall population in this area under five years old at 7.8 percent uh, I also think it's significant to think about the third of the women and children are under 20 years old. So you can kind of take into perspective that these are also very young, you know, mothers taking care of these children. Not only may they might not have gotten uh, any parenting role models, but they're also still growing up themselves. Uh, next slide. So again, uh, just a reminder of that historical avoidance of governmental agencies. You know, we go into this work because we wanna help the families. You know, Tribal Family Partners Program, we go in and we call ourselves partners because we wanna walk, want walk alongside our families, uh, but we have to come in with all honesty. We're, we are funded by the federal government. We have to collect data for that. And sometimes that's a little scary for them. So we have to take a lot of time to explain that, slow down, you know, re-explain our agenda there with them that we are trying to walk alongside with them. Um, and then also it becomes challenging just trying to get them referrals or getting them engaged, you know, other places that if we say, oh, this family could use uh, CalWORKs assistance Maybe they don't want to go do that. Like Marcy said, not only is it daunting to do that application, but they don't want to give their information to anybody else because historically that hasn't you know, been a positive experience for them. Uh, we also encounter parents that are having their own challenges with mental health or developmental delays. And they may have kind of been pushed through the system because of that avoidance of wanting to get help because of, you know, they, they've just dependent, been dependent within their community without all the resources. And so we often find that we're serving families or we're, we're meeting parents that are, you know, in their thirties that have undiagnosed, you know, problems of their own that they've just kind of decided to handle, you know, within their their family and now their adults and their parents. And so they're not quite understanding their own, their own challenges, let alone on top of us, us trying to show them that their child may have some needs. Um, and then the, the family as a whole, they always think about this intergenerational and I'm sure this exists in a lot of other communities, not just Native American, but for the picture here is showing like I may be doing services with this mother who has the children, but then you see the grandmother lives in the home too. So I'm working with the mother 
and they have respect for grandmother's perspective and they look to the grandmother to kind of give them guidance. So if I, if we identify that there's a need with this child or, you know, for them that they will go to, they'll go to grandma and grandma will say, no, you know, we're, we got this far, we're fine. And so they're resistant to that. And so I have to know that I need to engage the whole family as a whole sometimes, not just the parent. Um, and then just knowing appropriate resource referrals. Sometimes, you know, there's such limited resource for Native Americans that we're sending them off at a blind chase there for doing, uh, following up for their doctor's appointments and things like that. But sometimes we have to, kind of, our staff themselves have to really look into where they're referring to and understanding that before they even, you know, make a suggestion to look up the local doctors in the community or new pediatrician or schools. Um, and then we also come across a lot of that resistance to services outside of us. When we finally get the buy-in here at our organization, Indian Health or with Tribal Family Partners, they want to stick with us because we've developed a trust with them, but we're not, you know, we're parent, they're parent partners. They're not mental health workers. You know, they're not experts on diagnosing those child, you know, delay, developmental delays, but they don't want to go beyond us because we've, we've established that relationship. So us as staff, we need to kind of be familiar with the outside resources so we can kind of get that buy-in and show them that we trust the outside uh, resources. So they'll, they may, you know, listen to us and decide that they're gonna go ahead and go through with it. Uh, the next slide. Uh, again, this is just emphasizing to know your local resources and your local native resources. A lot of times, you know, people are referred to parenting programs in our community and not a lot of people will know about tribal family partners. It's a word of mouth. So they really have to come and seek us out. And so I think one thing that's been a lesson learned for us is for our staff to be engaged in looking for those resources, to actually call and talk to somebody and find out what that organization is doing, who they serve and exactly what the needs are of that. Because it, an example would be, we have the Inland Regional Center and they, they have their, um, their certain delays that they serve over time, so autism, and things like that. Well, our staff came in thinking, okay, a child development delay, they'll go ahead and they'll send them their way. But we were referring inappropriately because our staff just thought, oh, they handle the delays and not realizing they were only specific to autism. So, and then re looking at those again and again, you know, every year when grant funded, we're all familiar with that, they change. And so every year, look at your resource list again, re call, make the phone call before you refer those families because you're working with families that distrust already. And if you give them an, a dead end referral, that may just contribute to their, their uh, what the word is, contribute to them being resistant to those referrals as well. So next slide. Uh, in here, I, we learned, I, like I mentioned before, that the parents, they're not coming along with a lot of parenting skills already. We're teaching them about child development. Do they understand why we're giving them those referrals? Are they understanding why their children got removed from their home? Has somebody explained that to them? Or are they just in that trauma, in that, you know, survival mode that they don't they're not comprehending the extra. So an example for that would be most recently, I had a staff come to me and she said that her, her family had stopped sending her kids to school because she thought she was gonna homeschool them because of the pandemic. Well, she didn't enroll them in a homeschool program and she had you know, six-year-old, a 12-year-old and 
she had given her some resources. Well, there's homeschool programs. You should enroll them, you know, keep, get them started with school. And she kept coming back and realizing that the family was not, you know, enrolling her kids in a homeschool program. So we decided that before we go report that she's not, you know, that it's legally, she has to be educating her children. We pulled up the law, the California law, and she went to her and she explained to her that, you know, it is California law that you have to send your children to school or I'm a mandated reporter, I'm gonna to have to report that. And then the next month she went to visit her and her kids were in school. But you know, we had to we had to really walk her through that for her to understand, you know, that concept because she didn't know. She just, you know, we had to let we had to show her that. Um, and I think giving families language to talk, you know, we do certain screenings with our program. We do domestic violence screenings. And if I say, oh, you know, I know Marcy's department, they deal with uh, domestic violence. You're positive for the screening, go call over there. They don't know why they call it, why they're calling there, or do they want the support? So they might need to be able, they need to be able to call them and say, you know, this is what my, what we've identified. I want the help, uh, you know, the domestic violence has caused my children to be removed and, you know, giving them the language to kind of have those conversations with other professionals. And then of course, always looking for native specific, because they would be more likely to utilize those. Uh, next slide for the sake of time, trying to go quickly through the end here. Um, also, I wanted to mention, you know, when we first come in contact with these families, a lot of us want to be sensitive now. And sometimes language matters. You know, I'm on a level where you could probably, you could say Indian, you could say tribal, you could say I'm from a nation, you could say I'm indigenous. And it's, I realized that it's so complex that it's not offensive to me, but in this movement of resilience or you know this historical trauma that has happened in these labels, they become something that could be triggering. So walking in the door and asking, just simply asking, how would you like to be identified? You know, you know, are you from a tribe? Maybe it is that they are native and they're accessing services, but the predominant uh, culture in the family is Hispanic or Filipino. So you you just kind of, you have to ask those questions and not be afraid to ask, you know, sensitively and let them know, you know, you're doing that because you want to know more about them. Um, and then again, just being in connection with different cultural events, you know, attending those. I, I'm I made the mistake of saying events because we always say like, oh, you should attend a powwow. Well, it's not necessarily a powwow is kind of a show that they put on of Native Americans, and that's not a traditional concept. So, you know, connecting with your local tribal communities, is there an elder that you can speak with? Um, are, are they offering, are they inviting the public in to engage in any of their different ceremonies or things that they have going on? Uh, respecting those spiritual beliefs, like Marcy emphasized, those are, those are really big in the native population that's a part of us you know in our organization it's it's unusual when i came from the school district when we have events even when we come together for meetings we pray you know we come in a circle and we pray and that is just a part of the culture you know within the native communities um and then prioritizing does the parents have more needs, you know, they're not going to understand the needs of the child right now. You need to address those immediate things with the parents for them to be well and healthy, for them to, you know, take on the education of what is it that their child is needing next. Uh, in the next slide, I just wanted to um, emphasize that we all are here to advocate for the children, right? We all you know, we want to work for the children, but when you're working with a community or you want to work with the parents and guide them, think about being the ally, what it means to be an ally. 
you know, our program calls ourselves partners for a reason, because we want to walk in, we want to be sensitive, we want to walk alongside them, find out what their perspective is and their understanding before, you know, we move forward. And the next slide is just kind of reiterating that, you know, here we have liaisons of point of contact when, you know, Lydia, Lydia became our contact to start developing this and we talked with her a lot. She wanted to understand what our programs were before we presented so she could present us to you. So, you know, just thinking of those things instead of assuming like we've all been, you know, guilty of doing in the past. And again, if you make allies with some native resources, then you might have a little more buy-in with the native families for them to take on, to take those referrals. If you trust it, then they may trust it. Uh, and the next slides are just sharing some more resources for future learning. We, uh, Marcy had mentioned Dawnland. There's some links on here. I just pulled out some ones about parenting and racism, but if you go to the Native Wellness Institute on YouTube, you'll find they've been doing since the pandemic started, they've been doing power hours every Monday through Friday, and you can find all kinds of topics on children and the just Native Americans in general. Um, that last link here is talking a little bit more about the foster system and Native American children being removed. Uh, the next slide is a little more, is a few more resources that Marcy had mentioned, the Don Lamb Wilbriety Journey to Forgiveness. Um, and I really, if those seem like too much, you don't have the time to do it, I really encourage you to at least pull up this We Shall Remain video. It's only six minutes, but it says so much in such a small amount of time for you know, where the children are headed in the future. So thank you so much. I tried to fast forward that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that, Jacqueline and Marcelina. I truly, truly appreciate you taking the time to share this information. I think it's vital, especially in our, you know, our state and the unique, the just the um, sheer population of Native and tribal folks. So I, I'm very happy that you were able to come here today and really give your perspective and this historic uh, this history lesson, which I think is vital to serving families. Everyone will receive this, this PowerPoint um, in the follow-up email that we will have. Um, we also will be sharing a recording of this. Um, we upload it to our YouTube channel, Strategies uh, TA, so everyone will be able to access this. Um, we want to also um, have a few minutes for questions, so we will, if you're able to stay for that, we can do that. Um, I did want to share an article that while I was doing some research for this webinar, I found that I will put in the chat talking about um, some nurses did a research paper around how ACEs changes, um, I think it's called methylation changes in the genes. So what Marcelina talked about, about this, you know, generational trauma and what that translates, there's actually genetic, um, genetic changes that happen. If anyone is ever read about epigenetics, it's really how gene translation changes throughout generations. And they're seeing that um, there's, they're doing studies on many different populations, but who've, who have experienced generational trauma or genocides and how that translates into um, future generations. So I will share a link to that video. In the meantime, if anyone has questions for Jacqueline and Marcelina before we close out, please let us know. It looks like um, Martha share, she's actually been sharing some really amazing things um, that has that have uh, are happening in her area. I think she shared something um, earlier about um, Martha, do you want to unmute yourself? Let's see if I can find you on here to um, maybe share a little bit about what you put in the chat. 
So um, I live in California here in Merced, California, and um, there was a, a group that was out of Northern California called NorCal Warriors. At one time, um, this gentleman wanted to donate some equipment to a school and was told that he could not donate the equipment because he was not a 501c3. So he developed the 501c3 and began to contribute to the high school um, some equipment. But as it happens, many of us go into our different careers and he had this 501c3. He got a hold of an elder here in Merced and um, he spoke to him and he said, here, this is yours. So he gave, he gifted the group of, of natives here in Merced and told them, um, do what you want with it. And he, his, his vision was to bring together tribes that have been separated from their tribes within um, the states. Like you might have somebody that is here in Merced, but their tribe is in Oklahoma, for example, and there's no way they're going to be able to come back, but their, their culture, their, uh, their ways, their, their, um, their religion, their faith, everything is all, um, it's been compromised. And for so many years, many, many natives have forgotten. It's not that they didn't want to, but it was just like, not an, it's not, um, afforded to them that's not something that they can actually engage in so that disconnect is further you know it's a day-to-day -day, uh, struggle of identity and loss of, of person you know so so what he has proposed is to come together and bring together the native populations that are are sprinkled throughout California that don't have that connection because sometimes even though there are 150 something odd tribes there are so many other tribes that haven't been uh I guess, validated or identified because the process is so hard and arduous to be able to even go through the hoops that you can't even say that you are native because um, how, how are you native? You know, how much percent do you have? Well, if I know that I'm native and I know that I, I have that, which I am, um, I never really pursued it. My father was born in 1908. And at one point he told me, Miha, he says, to be Indian was at one point something so, so um, deadly. Like you could die if you said that you were Indian. So many became Mexican, many became, you know, Hispanic. They took on surnames, they took on identities so they could assimilate so that they could be. And even though we were treated badly, it was not as bad as it would have been to be an Indian. And I thought that was the most horrible thing to hear. And my father had so many different perspectives on culture and and uh, and racism that it stayed within me, you know. And when I got the opportunity to work with with um, all these different people that are that are putting this organization called NorCal Warriors, it um, it awakened something in me that that was so um, so intrinsic. I had no idea that I wanted to understand more about this within myself. So I started exploring where did my father come from? You know, the, the saying that for us in, in our culture, uh, being Hispanic, they're always called us pochas, you know, like you're from here, but your family is in, in Mexico. So you're really not Mexican. You're a pocha, you know, and, and my, and my friend, he, he, uh, he told me something that that hurt me at the same time it woke me up because he that was the only way he could make me understand how much pain that causes he says do you know, never call yourself a pocha he says because a pocha what it really means is the the waste what is left of you know and he says when we call each other those names we think that it's nothing but we've adopted what names they brought on to us and we identify with those names. So never call yourself a pocha because you are not the waste. You are the first of the crop. You are the best of the best. And 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 then it, it made me explore more about the Indian population in Mexico and how I became, how we migrated here, how we were here already. And it wasn't a it wasn't a measure of of uh, where are you from. This was all one land. We were all from this land. We we were nomadic people. We came. I'm Apache, I'm a, a Kachikane, and, and uh, my father was from Zacatecas, and, and we have family here, we have family in other places, and that is how we saw each other. You, you greeted your brother with, with, with honor, respect, knowing that no matter where they were at, they were part of something bigger. And, and I, I am so excited because I get to be part of a group and writing their bylaws and their mission statement, and what they're trying to, um, 
do is is repair like give some kind of healing to the people that are that are, have not even explored their culture you know it's one thing to say that you're apache or one thing to say that you're sue but to really understand the the um pathways that that the people went through individually to become and to be where they're at so many of us are already you know we've been able to to identify with our tribes but there are so many that don't and can't you know because some have, have been extinct not all but some have you know and and those connections have been um marginalized so it, it's it's empowering to be in these circles and the land acknowledgments are so important to realize that we were here we didn't we didn't get discovered we've been here and and we want to continue to um be present in in um in these circles. I work in environmental justice and that is a big um, barrier for a lot of indigenous folks, the water, just simple things like water. Like we live in a country that should have potable water and for so many reservations, there's no potable water. There's not you know, um, equity in, in land use. There's not equity in roadways. So my job outside of what I do, <laughs> and I'm also an ACE facilitator. So I worry about that prospect for for the indigenous people too because i don't think that that's a perspective that has really been presented to, to the native uh, population and that's because it's so important to understand that as children we're still suffering from the generations in the past and that cycle even though some for some it's been broken it continues and we need to recognize that so thank you for giving me my two, two minutes Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, Martha, and bringing up some, I think, key issues that are um, really just uh, important for other people who are non-Native to really know and, and understand. Jacqueline and Marcelina, is there anything you wanted to um, share with us before we... Um, I was... I remember John had popped up asking about our families being affected by ACEs. And yes, of course we do. But one of the things within our own little program, we decided not to do like the ACEs assessment because we wanted to become strength-based. We know, you know, we have all these labels. We know that we have alcoholism. We know that there's higher rates of domestic violence. The kids are in foster. What are the positive things? we wanted to highlight those and so we didn't want to focus on those because we already know we're at a disadvantage and so we're going to come in and we're going to pull out the strengths we're going to you know let culture be a protective factor and let them learn more about their culture um, and focus on those and then highlight their parenting behaviors that they're learning so just a little i mean that's not everybody's approach but that's what ours became because we wanted to have just positive experiences and we weren't mental health workers so i just wanted to thank everyone for uh sharing this space with us um we appreciate all of your um, input and um, just your willingness to have this conversation with us so please feel free our information is um, available um in the powerpoint and so if we can assist in any way, please feel free to, to reach out to us. And thank you again for to all sharing for sharing your stories and, and all the participation. Yes, thank you everyone for engaging in um, some really wonderful conversations. I think this this was really um, I think powerful. And also to Jacqueline and Marcelina again for your wonderful presentation. Um, also, uh, Julie Andrews for helping kind of coordinate. Um, she, I, I don't know if she was able to join us. Um, I know she had a previous en engagement, but I, I'm just so thankful to have met all of you folks and really thankful for you to share your information and your work with us. Um, I know we're a little bit over, but if you have a moment, um, I think we have a survey monkey that kind of helps us know how things went, how we can improve our webinars. So for those of you who are able to click onto that, if you could um, just do that quickly. If you don't have time today, we will send it in the follow-up email. So as much feedback as we can get, the better. 
So again, thank you all for joining us this morning. I truly appreciate your time and, um, you know, really, really learned so much today myself and, and just will continue to um, increase my knowledge. So thank you all.